Income tax 2023-2024, depreciation of rental property part number two. Get ready and some coffee because the only thing certain about life is death in taxes. The only thing certain about death is more taxes. Most of the First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information can be found in publication 527 residential rental property, including rental of vacation homes tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the individual income tax formula, we're on line one income. Remember in the first half of the income tax formula, it's basically a funny income statement where we have income minus instead of expenses, deductions resulting in instead of net income, taxable income. The rental property typically reported on the Schedule E, similar to a Schedule C for a small proprietor business has an income statement format where we in essence have rental income minus rental expenses, which you can think of as rental deductions resulting in, in essence, net rental income, which is what flows from the Schedule E to line one of the income tax formula. The income tax formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040, of which we see page one income section here, Schedule E ultimately rolling into line eight, additional income from Schedule one. This is Schedule 1, Additional Income and Adjustments to Income, Part Number 1, Additional Income, Schedule E, rolling into Line 5, Rental Real Estate from the Schedule E. This is the Schedule E, Supplemental Income and Loss from Rental Real Estate, Royalties, and so on and so forth, having an income statement type of format. In prior presentations, we discussed a little bit of the income statement format of the uh, Schedule E, and we're going to continue on it now, focusing in on the depreciation, now thinking about the methods of depreciation, remembering that with rental property, typically we're going to be owning the rental property, and therefore we're going to put it on the books as an asset, and then allocate the cost over its useful life, basically doing an accrual component thing, which we have to do even if we're basically on a cash-based system in a similar way as we have to deviate from a cash-based system if we're on a Schedule C business and we have large pieces of equipment, for example. So here we're going to focus mainly on the property itself, also noting that we're starting our focused attention as though we have a separate property, possibly a separate residential rental home, which we're not counting as our second home, but rather as rental property. So it's purely rental property, noting that we're going to then add complications later where the rental property might have uh, some personal components to it, either because we live in it and that's our primary residence and we rent a portion of the property or because we have a second property that's like vacation home, for example. And when we think about expenses, then we're going to have to break out the expenses between personal and business. Also remembering that the expenses related to property for our personal or primary residence is kind of a strange deviation from the tax code, which confuses a lot of people because we get to deduct the interest on the mortgage and possibly the real estate taxes. But that's kind of weird because the home is personal property. So that's probably came about from, I'm, from my skeptical viewpoint I think it would came, come about from the people that are in the business of real estate who wanted to you know, pump money into their, into their place so they had lobbyists in there, but, but whatever. So just note 
that we don't normally deduct on the principal residence, the depreciation on the property and other things related to the property like improvements because it's personal. If it was business, then those things become legitimate type of deductions because they're part of your business activity, ordinary necessary expenses in order to help generate the revenue. All right, so the depreciation methods, we will recall generally, you must use the uh, modified accelerated recovery system. So depreciation for taxes is a little bit different than you might be used to if you're a bookkeeper and you've worked with like say generally accepted accounting principles, for example, because the incentives are a little bit different. If you're in a situation where you're in like a publicly traded company, you make financial statements, those financial statements being used by investors possibly to see if they want to invest, buy and sell stocks and whatnot. So that means that you have an incentive to be accurate on the financial statements and there's internal controls such as an audit to make sure that you're in compliance with those rules so that the people that are investing have as accurate information as they can to make a legitimate types of investments therefore for depreciation which is an estimate you might have a little bit more leeway to kind of figure out what the useful life of the property is and what would be most accurate from a reporting standpoint for investors for decision making purposes but for the tax code obviously as taxpayers we don't have an audit of all of our tax returns we have a we have a random audit or possibly the IRS chooses to audit for whatever reason number one is a problem and number two you've got the the situation where we want to get the deduction as soon as possible we would rather typically depreciate the entire million dollar building up front if we could if we had the income to consume it because deductions sooner rather than later are typically more beneficial so the tax code then has to have more restrictions on exactly what property needs to be depreciated what way in other words what's going to be the useful life defined by a particular property given by the tax code what's the method that's going to be used straight line method versus a double declining or an accelerated method and what's the convention meaning do we assume we bought it in the middle of the year half year convention the middle of the month, mid-month convention, and so on and so forth. With real estate property, we're usually talking a fairly long useful life, and we're talking then that we have to use a mid-month convention usually, and the uh, straight line method typically. All right, so if you place rental property in service before 1987, you are using one of the following methods. Now this is going back because the code changed so now we're going way back to 1987 because then you had accelerated cost recovery system. Now that could still be in place because of the fact that we want to keep a consistent method once it's been put in place and we have a very long depreciable life when we're talking about real estate. So for property placed in service after 1980 but before 1987, straight line or declining balance method over the useful life of property placed in service before 1981 rental property placed in service before 2023 continue to use the same method of figuring depreciation that you used in the past so in other words we're going to say hey look you need to use the maker's method and you might say hey i already have a tax return and they're not using the maker's method well that might be because they put it on the books way back when before the maker's method took place when the maker's method was put in place usually you have to put it in going forward from this point going forward because we don't want to go back and recalculate the depreciation of prior property because that will be very complex so typically we're going to use the same method and if the law changes usually the law is smart enough to say okay we're just going to make the change from this point going forward therefore you're going to keep on rolling out what was on there before uh, until the useful life is is used up or whatever use uh use of real property changed generally you must use a makers to depreciate real property that you acquire for personal use before 1987 and change to business or income producing use in after 1987 so this includes your residence that you change to rental use so if you bought your home you might say hey look i bought my home before that time do i have to use the old methods well no because it was personal property you didn't put it on the books until as rental property until you converted it to rental property in which case you're going to apply the applicable method at that time which is now the maker's method 
So C property owned or used in 1986 in chapter one of publication 946 for those situations in which acres isn't allowed. All right, improvements made after 1986. So improvements, remember, if you do something to the property, it's either going to be maintenance, which you would like it to be because then you could just write it off or improvements, which means you're gonna have to depreciate it over some useful life. Now, this is where things get quite complex because if we have to put something on the books as an asset, now we, now we play the game of, I would like to have the useful life as low as possible. I'd like to be able to take 179 deduction or special depreciation if that was possible. And I would like to have an accelerated method, all of which usually get the depreciation sooner rather than later. So in other words, I would like to count it as equipment if it was possible, meaning if I put something new into the building, do I have to count it as improvement, depreciating it over like 20 to 30 years? Or can I call it equipment, depreciating it over seven years, possibly being allowed a special depreciation, 179 deduction, and accelerated method of double declining rather than straight line. So these are, these you could find gray areas in these in these areas that you always kind of want to keep in mind to make sure that if you can choose a useful life that's less than straight line 30 years or some 20 to 30 years then that usually is more beneficial okay as a result you can depreciate that improvement as separate property under makers if it is the type of property that otherwise qualifies for makers depreciation so if it was a new roof or something like that then you're not going to change the basis of the property before but rather put a new line on the depreciation schedule but depreciating it over the same method as though you purchased the property for the rental property uh, which is the maker's depreciation method so for more information about improvements see additions or improvements to property later in this chapter under recovery periods under gds basis of depreciation property the basis of property so remember the basis you can think of as kind of like the adjusted cost which for taxes in a similar way to like to like energy uses it's potential energy or what i call potential deduction so the basis is what you paid for that they didn't let you take a deduction for up front on a cash based system but they're going to make you leak out the energy over time the potential deductions over time and then the basis will go down as you consume the benefit from the potential deductions in the form of depreciation so the basis of property used in a rental activity is generally its adjusted basis when you place it in service in that activity this is its cost or other basis when you acquire it adjusted for certain items in occurring before you place it in service in the rental activity so in other words if you buy the property basis is going to clearly be the cost now just like when we talked about like if you install a freezer because you're an ice cream shop seller it's not just the cost of the freezer but also the cost of the installation for example to get it in working order that is included in the cost of the freezer rather than writing off the maintenance guy that you might think you should write off because he's doing maintenance on the freezer but it's not just maintenance he put he had to put the freezer in place before you could start using it and therefore that might need to be included in the cost similarly when you buy the property you're going to look at possibly the closing statement and all the stuff that you had to do paying lawyers and the escrow and whatnot might need to be something that not can't be expensed but rather included as part of the cost of the property we also run into the problem that if you bought the property before and now you are transforming it, you're moving out of it as your personal residence and then making it rental, what's the basis? Because I bought it way back when. Is it the adjusted basis or is it now the fair market value? So we might touch on that uh, in a second later. Uh, so that's a question as well. And if we inherited the property or it was gifted to us, then how do we calculate the basis is it the basis at the point in time we inherited it fair market value or is it the basis 
fair market value at this point in time or is it the basis of the person who gifted it or inherited it to us and so on so if you depreciate your property under makers you may also have to reduce your basis by certain deductions and credits with respect to the property basis and adjustment basis are explained in the following discussion caution if you use the property for personal purposes before changing it to rental use its basis for depreciation is the lesser here we go the lesser of its adjusted basis or its fair market value now both of these are going to be more difficult to find than if it was a new rental property or it was rental property before because with rent if you bought it you know what the cost is because you just paid for it but if it was rental property you have been tracking the basis most likely with a depreciation schedule because that's because you get a deduction for it if it's personal property your principal residence although it has a tax implication in that you get a deduction for the mortgage interest and the property taxes you don't get to depreciate it and therefore you're probably not tracking your adjusted basis as closely as you otherwise would in other words if you put a new kitchen in it if you replace the roof and so on and so forth you might not you might have taken a loan out to do that but you might not be formally writing down what's the basis of my property because you don't get the depreciation therefore are not tracking a, depre a, a property basis schedule so you might have to look into what is the actual basis at that point in time and the fair market value also difficult because we're talking about something that is unique property is unique unlike stocks if i was trading stocks i can look at the stock market and see what the fair market value is at any given time with property we might have to hire an appraiser or something or do our best to see what the fair market value is all right see basis of property changed to rental use in chapter four cost basis the the basis of property you buy is usually its cost the cost of the amount you pay for it in cash in debt obligation in other property or in services so when we buy the property then that's obviously going to be the cost that's going to be basically the initial basis remembering it's not just the cash we paid for it remembering that when people say the bank owns my house usually that started out as being like overly humble right it was supposed to say oh i don't own the house the bank owns the house i'm not doing that well or something like you're downplaying or something like that because that's not exactly right right the bank doesn't own your home the bank you owe the bank money you might owe the bank a lot of money but they can't come into your kitchen table and tell you at your at your dinner meeting that you need to paint the garage orange or i guess rainbow colored with what they make you color it these days because they're getting influenced by the government right and you're like no i'm not doing that i'm not doing that i don't care if i owe you money if i default on the loan if i default on the loan then you could foreclose on it and you could paint you could paint the garage whatever you want but until then it's my right so it's different so you took out a loan you own the property and the bank has no rights over it un until you so so that means it's still part of the base it's still part of the cost of the property even you paid for it with finance money because you're paying the rent on the finance money and the form of interest if you pay for the property with something else like goods and services then again you have to figure it's more complicated from a bookkeeping standpoint but you're still paying for it in barter in that case so sales tax charged on the purchase but see uh, exception uh freight freight charges to obtain the property and installation and testing charges so these are all things obviously if there if it was some kind of property that you paid sales tax on then let's think let's think about that freezer that you put into the ice cream shop because you sell ice cream sales tax on the freezer is part of the cost the the freight charges to get the freezer to you you can't just expense those you would think you might be able to but no because they're really part of the cost to get the freezer operational and then the installation fees you might think you should expense those as maintenance but it's not maintenance it's the initial installation and therefore the iris wants you to include that as part of the cost and depreciate it over its useful life exception if you deducted state and local general sales taxes as an itemized deduction on schedule a form 1040 don't include as part of your cost basis uh, the sales taxes you deducted such taxes were deductible before 1987 and after 2003 
So meaning if you got a deduction for the taxes, you already got a benefit from it and therefore it shouldn't be included in the basis. Otherwise you'd be in a form of double dipping because remember the basis represents potential energy, potential deduction, which you will get in the future in the form of depreciation or possibly at the point of sale of the property, in which case the higher basis would be reducing the amount of gain or increasing the amount of loss at the point of sale. Loans with low or no interest. So if you buy property on any payment plan that charges little or no interest, the basis of your property is your stated purchase price less the amount considered to be unstated interest. Now this is somewhat unusual to happen, but it does somewhat ha it does happen sometimes. Note that if you have a loan situation like if you were to loan someone money, someone asks you they need $50,000, you're like, okay, I'll loan you the money. If you just give them $50,000 and you're saying, just pay it back to me in 15 years or in monthly installments over 15 years and you don't charge any interest, it's not really a loan in that case because you're gifting, you're, you're basically, they're, they're gonna pay you back less than you gave them, right? So, so, and we know that because we know that, that, that there's going to be inflation at least, right? That, that we should have an interest rate that at least compensates for inflation. If it was a market transaction, then you would expect the interest rate to be equivalent to market interest rates, which have to accommodate for inflation and risk. So if you have a loan that doesn't have interest rates broken out, the assumption is that interest rates are really in there somewhere and you gotta kinda impute the interest rates. So, uh, and that's just something to be careful of anytime you're in a loan situation. If, if you want a legitimate loan that's gonna be set up, you should ask for the interest rates to be defined. If you're, a loan, if you're getting a loan from someone else that's not acquainted to you and they don't include interest rates, you're gonna question the price that they're charging because that doesn't make any sense, right? They, 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 why would they not do that? And if it's a personal loan, then you possibly want to include market value interest rates to make sure that it's a legitimate loan in the event that you got an audit or something like that where the IRS is gonna say, well, it was a personal thing and not, okay. So see unstated interest and original issue discount, the OID, it's publication 537. Real property. If you buy real property such as building and land, certain fees and other expenses you pay are part of your cost basis in the property, real estate taxes. So if you buy real property, so real property meaning real estate, right? So now we're gonna have certain things on the closing statement, which you might have to include in the basis of the property in a similar way as when we saw the freezer for the ice cream salesperson having to include the shipping and installation as the cost of the, of the, of the property rather than expensing it. So if you buy real property and agree to pay real estate taxes on it that were owed by the seller and the seller doesn't reimburse you, the taxes pay are treated as part of your basis in the property. So oftentimes because the property goes through escrow, you're gonna have all these kind of things on the escrow. And one of the things that could take place is, well, the, the other owner still owes property taxes and now you're gonna be paying the property taxes as part of the purchase. And if you're paying their property taxes because it wasn't property taxes incurred by you because you didn't yet own the property, then you're really, that's just part of the purchase price, you would think, and therefore should be included in the cost or basis of the property. So, so you can't deduct them as taxes paid. So you might be tempted, just like with the installation of the freezer, to write off the installation as repairs and maintenance, but in here you might be tempted to write off the taxes as property taxes, but you can't because you're not the one that incurred the property taxes, right? You didn't own the property when the property taxes were incurred. It was the other guy's property taxes and you're paying off the other guy's taxes, which would be the same as if you paid the other guy for the property and then he paid his own dang taxes. It's just that it's happening through the, the, the escrow. So if you reimburse the seller for real estate taxes, the seller paid for you, you can usually deduct that amount. Don't include that in, in your basis in the property. All right, settlement fees and other costs. The following settlement fees and closing costs for buying the property are part of your basis in the property. So now you've got all these settlement fees and closing costs, 
all of these kind of things. And again, those are similar to us paying for the shipping and installation of the freezer in our ice cream shop, which we can't typically just expense at the point in time they happen because they're part of the installation of the freezer and therefore have to be part of the basis of the property. We then get a benefit in the form of depreciation rather than off the bat. So we have the abstract fees. We've got charges for installing utility service, legal fees. The lawyers are always in there with their hand out grabbing stuff. So recording fees, surveys, uh, transfer taxes, title insurance. So any amounts the seller owes that you agree to pay such as back taxes or interest, recording or mortgage fees, charges for improvement or repairs and sales commissions. The following are settlement fees and closing costs you can't include in your basis in the property. So fire insurance premiums, rent or other charges related to occupancy of the property before closing, charges connected with getting or refinancing a loan, such as points, discuss points, loan origination fees. So points, uh, remember, has to do with the financing typically, typically has to do with the interest, has its own kind of complications because typically you're prepaying the interest. So we talked about points a little bit before, but the idea there is it wouldn't be part of the cost of the property, but still might be something that you have to put on the books and amortize over the life of the loan in some way. We touched on that before. Loan uh, assumption fees. So so that relates to the, to the financing of the loan. So And so notice that that's not part of the purchase of the property. It's part of the financing that you're then going to use to purchase the property. So it might seem similar, but it's kind of two different things. You're going to get the financing so that you have the money to buy the property. The stuff related to the financing here, the points, the loan assumption fees are part, might may be expensable, right? As part of your business expenses, if you're getting the loan in order to buy the property and not part of the basis of the property because it's part of the financing. Cost of the credit report and fees for an appraisal are required by a lender. Also, don't include amounts placed in escrow for the, for the future payments of items such as taxes uh, and insurance. So if it's in escrow and you haven't yet paid it out of the escrow for those things, you haven't really, it's in that kind of holding account, but it hasn't actually been paid uh, for the taxes and insurance at that point. So assumption of a mortgage. So if you buy property and become liable for an existing mortgage on the property, your basis in the amount you pay for the property plus the amount remaining to be paid on the mortgage. All right, so now this is just changing the dynamics a little bit. So let's just imagine the real estate, how the real estate transaction usually works. Usually you got the person selling. He's gonna sell it for 100,000. Maybe he's got a $20,000 loan on the property that he needs to pay off with the sales price that he's get, he's hoping to get a hundred thousand. You're going to buy the property for a hundred thousand, but you don't have a hundred thousand. You need to finance. So that means that you're going to get a loan maybe for eighty thousand dollars in order to get the hundred thousand. Put the twenty thousand down. Now you have a hundred thousand to pay for the property. You now own the property with a loan of eighty thousand. The guy that got the hundred thousands is now gonna pay off the loan that he still owed and then keep the, the rest is the general idea. But you can imagine a situation where the guy has the property that he wants to sell for $100,000 to $20,000 loan and you are simply going to incur the loan as part of the purchase price. So you're gonna pay you know the 80,000 and then you incur the debt, meaning the debt's gonna shift the same loan basically shifting from the seller to the buyer. Well. In essence, then you've, you've kind of have done a similar thing. In, in this case, paying 100,000, you paid the 80,000 uh, in cash and you incurred a debt of 20,000 that you're gonna have to pay in the future. Instead of taking out the debt yourself, you basically are just taking over the debt of the, of the seller. So that would mean the basis. So that was a little bit more unusual, but you can see the, idea. So you buy a building for 60,000 cash and assume the mortgage of 240,000 on it. 
your basis in that case would be the 300,000. Why? Because you bought it for 60,000 and instead of taking out a new loan, you incurred the other guy's loan, the seller's loan, which was 240,000, which is similar to taking out another loan on our end, on the buyer end, meaning we basically bought it for 300,000, in that case, 60,000 cash and 240,000 financed. Separating cost of land and buildings. So if you buy buildings uh, and your cost includes the cost of the land on which they stand, you must divide the cost between land and building to figure the basis for depreciation of the building. So remember that there's different depreciation for the land and the building. If I buy property, if I pay $100,000 for property, I typically am not going to be paying, I'm not going to say, hey, look, I'm paying you $60,000 for the building, $40,000 for the land. That's not in part of the purchase process. But for taxes, I will have to take that $100,000 allocate between land and building because the building is the depreciable part, not the land. My incentives are to want to put more into the building than the land from a tax standpoint because I can't touch that potential energy, potential deduction of the land until I sell it. Whereas if it's in the building, I can depreciate it. How am I going to get that information? One of the more common ways is you can look at the property taxes. Property taxes often will not equal exactly the sales price. The property taxes might be based on a prior assessment, possibly 80000 or something, but it will often break out the land and building which they're assessing the taxes on and if the 80,000 that the taxes was broken out on had a ratio of like 60 40 land to building you might be able to use that same ratio to apply out 60 40 to your purchase price of the building at the 100,000 and that's one idea that you can kind of use so the part of the cost that you allocate to each asset is the ratio of the fair market value of that asset to the fair market value of the whole property at the time you buy it. So if you aren't certain of the fair market values of the land and the building, usually you will not be, you can divide the cost between them based on their assessed values for real estate tax purposes. Just like I said, example. So you buy a house uh, and land for 200,000. The purchase contract doesn't specify how much of the purchase price is for the house and how much is for the land. It typically won't. Why would it? Why does it care? Doesn't matter. It's all the same to them. It's the property is the property. So the latest real estate tax assessment on the property was based on an assessed value of 160,000 of which 136,000 was for the house and 24,000 was for the land. Notice that the 160,000 does not equal the 200,000. Therefore, I can't just put it on the books for 136,000 and 24,000, but I might be able to use the ratio here to then apply out to my 200,000. So, so you can uh, allocate 85%, so that's the 136,000 divided by the 160,000, 85% going uh, to the house and 24,000 over the total 160,000, 15%. 15 and 85 obviously add up to 100. So we have the 15, 85% breakout of land and building applying those ratios then to our price. Your basis in the house is 200,000 cost times 85%, 170,000. And the land would be 200,000 times 15%. So we have 170,000 plus the 30,000 that adds up to the 200,000. The basis in the house is depreciable. The basis in the land is not. All right, basis other than cost. So you can't use cost as a basis for property that you received in return for service you performed. So you can't use cost as a basis for property that you received that you received in return for service performed in an exchange for other property as a gift from your spouse or from your former spouse as a result of a divorce or as an inheritance. So obviously, if we bought the property, then what we paid for it is going to be the basis of the property. But if we bought the property in, in return for services that were performed, then we're going to have to value how much of the services we perform. What's actually the value of, of the properties. It's not just the cost. It's going to be 
the value of the services, which is going to be diff difficult to figure in exchange for other property. Now, if we get into like a 1031 exchange situation, that is a whole nother course in and of itself. But the general idea might be that part of the basis for one property might be allocated to the other, but there's also going to be cash that usually is going to be involved. So, so it gets to be more of a complex type situation. Remember that if you have real estate though, and you're thinking about selling the real estate, that's often when the questions come up of, well, if it was my principal residence, I might get an exemption. Is there any way I can convert it to a principal residence possibly so that I can then get the exemption or a 1031 exchange, which might delay the, the, the tax implications by carrying over the basis, the potential energy to the new property. So the lowered potential energy basis going to the new property rather than recognizing the gain. So, so rather than having a step up in basis. So uh, again, we can talk about that possibly. It's a whole nother section on the 1031 exchange. Now, if it's a gift, someone gave you the property, well, then you didn't buy the property. Obviously, you can't put it on the books at the cost because you didn't pay for it. How do you figure out what the basis of the property is? Well, then you're going to have to think, okay, well, does it mean the fair market value at the point of the gift or more likely possibly the fair market value of the person who gave the property or is it you know, the lesser of the fair market value of the cost of the person that gave the property versus the uh, fair market value at the point in time you made it into rental property? So if it's from your spouse or from your former spouse as a result of a divorce. So now you have a divorce situation where again, the two, the, the property, when it was one, it might've been like personal property or something. It's not like you bought the property. It's basically an allocation of the property between the two individuals. So again, the question would be, you know, if you're converting it from personal to rental, what would be, you know, the basis of the property in that situation and as an inheritance. So someone dies, they leave you the property. These two, the one as a gift and inheritance are similar, but could have different implications in terms of when you're going to have what the basis will be. In other words, if you get it in inheritance and the property value went up, it's possible you might get a step up in basis, being able to take the basis or the low, the, the, the basis of the property, either possibly the lower of the two when the person died, the fair market value versus when you convert it to like rental property. Whereas the gift, I believe you might have a situation where you, you, you have to think about the basis for the person who gave the gift. Now that's going beyond the scope that I want to dive into too deeply here, but just realize that that whole topic of course gets into estate taxes, uh, uh, in situations in terms of passing things on from one generation to the other. Uh, and they're kind of tied together in many ways. So would it be better to gift something while someone's alive or would it be better to wait and then have it as inherited property? Part of that calculation might be like real estate taxes or estate taxes and this idea of basis and so on uh, in the property, uh, what would be best for taxes overall. All right, adjusted basis. To figure your property's basis for depreciation, you may have to make certain adjustments, increasing and decreasing to the basis of the property for events occurring between the time you acquire the property and the time you placed it in service for purposes for business or the production of income. The result of these adjustments to the basis is the adjusted basis. So we have this terminology, the basis, and then the adjusted basis. Many times in practice, people use those kind of interchangeably. So you might, but if you want to be specific about it, the basis is going to be, you know, the cost typically and the adjusted basis is the things, the basis that you adjusted for, which is typically the basis you're looking for if you were to sell the property or something uh, like that. So increases to basis. So you must increase the basis of any property by the cost of all items properly added to the capital account. These include the following. So the cost of any additions or improvements made before placing your property into service as a rental that have a useful life of more than one year. So you buy the property and then you haven't yet rented it at all. You make improvements to the property 
then you're going to include that in the cost of the property. Note that you might not, in this case, have it as a separate line item, which you may do if it was an improvement after the property was already in service, because in this case, the improvement was part of the process to get the property ready for service in a similar way as when we had our freezer for the ice cream shop, paying for the installation was necessary to get the property ready for service. Uh, so that's gonna be the idea there. So amount spent after uh, casualty to restore the damaged property. So, we, so, once, so the cost of extending utility service lines to the property and legal fees, such as the cost of defending and perfecting title or settling zone issues. So once again, that would be something that you would expect might ne need to happen before you could put the property in place. It's part of the acquisition and therefore the cost and therefore part of the basis you would think. Additions or improvements. So add to the basis of your property, the amount, uh, amount and addition or improvement actually cost you, including any amount you borrowed to make the addition or improvement. Similar idea with the financing. Financing, if you bought it with financing money, it's still yours. It's still part of the cost or basis. You're just going to have to pay off the financing rent, which is the interest. So this includes all direct costs, such as materials and labor, but doesn't include your own labor. It also includes all expenses related to the addition or improvement. For example, if you had an, an architect draw up plans for remodeling your property, the architect's fee is a part of the cost of the remodeling. Or if you had your lot surveyed uh, to put up a fence, the cost of the survey is a part of the cost of the fence. So like with the refrigerator being installed, you might think these things should be expensed, but no, like with the refrigerator or freezer, you have to include it in the cost of the freezer. Here, you have to include these in the cost of the improvement or the property because you needed those things in place to get the property ready to place it in service for rent. Keep separate accounts for depreciation additions or improvements made after you place the property in service in your rental activity. For information on depreciating additions or improvements, you can see additions or improvements to property later in this chapter under recovery periods under GDS. Caution! The cost of landscaping improvements is usually treated as an addition to the basis of the land, which isn't depreciable. So be careful with the landscaping. It's only the things that are right next to the, to the house, which would then be destroyed if you tear it down, which are depreciable, and you would like it to be depreciable. Otherwise, you're not going to get a tax benefit from it. You're not going to be able to dip into that potential energy, the potential deduction, until you actually sell the property because it'll be part of land instead of building. However, see what rental property can't be depreciated earlier. So assessments for local improvements, assessments for items which tend to increase the value of properties such as streets and sidewalks must be added to the basis of the property. For example, if your city installs curbing on the street in front of your house and assesses you and your neighbors for its cost, you must add the assessment to the basis of your property. Also, add the cost of legal fees paid to obtain a, a decrease in an assessment levied against property to pay for local improvements. You can't deduct these amounts as taxes or depreciate, depreciate them. So the idea here is they look like taxes, but really they're paying for things that are increasing the value of the property. Therefore, they're saying it should be an improvement rather than taxes. If you're paying real estate taxes that they're spending to, to improve the schools or something like that, then that's not directly benefiting you, but it's there for society. And therefore you would think that more likely would be possibly deductible as real estate taxes, as opposed to being included in part of the cost of the property because it's not increasing the value of the property. However, you can deduct assessments for the purpose of maintaining maintenance or repairs or for purpose of meeting interest charges related to the improvements. Don't add them to your basis in the property. All right. Deducting versus capitalizing costs. Don't add to your basis costs you can't deduct as current expenses. However, there are certain costs you can choose to either deduct or to capitalize. If you capitalize these costs, include them in your basis. If you deduct them, don't include them in your basis. The costs you may choose to deduct or capitalize include 
carrying charges such as interest and taxes that you must pay to own the own property. For more information about de deducting or capitalizing costs and how to make the election for carrying charges uh, in section uh, 263A and 266. Now, if you have the ability to elect one or the other, usually we would like to deduct things because we get the potential benefit earlier, but in some cases, it might be better for us to capitalize it. For example, if we don't have any income yet, we're in a low tax bracket, we expect our income to be more later, possibly in some cases, it might be more beneficial to capitalize. Decreases into bases. You must decrease the basis of your property by any items that represent a return of your cost. These include the following insurance or other payment you receive as the result of a casualty or theft loss. So obviously, if you, there's a theft and you're going to repair the property and so on, that's going to be the cost and the property increasing the basis. But if you got reimbursed for it, then that's going to decrease the, the basis. So decreasing the potential energy, the basis, the cost. So casualty loss not covered by insurance for which you took a deduction. So if you got a deduction, then you already got a benefit from it. And so that would be decreasing the cost basis potential energy because you've consumed it in a similar way as depreciation being consumed decreases the basis. Amounts you receive for granting an easement. Similar residential en uh, energy credits you were allowed before 1986 or after 2005 if you added the cost of the energy items to the basis of your home. So exclusion for income of subsidies for energy conservation measures, special depreciation allowance or a section 179 deduction claimed on qualified property. That's usually not real estate, but other types of property. If you've got a 179 deduction, then again, that's kind of like you already depreciate it. You already got a benefit for it, decreasing the potential energy because you've consumed part of it, the potential deduction. Depreciation you deducted or could have deducted on your tax return under the method of depreciation you choose if you don't deduct enough or deduct too much in any year. See depreciation under decreases to basis in publication 551. Clearly depreciation itself is the consumption of the potential energy, the basis, which will then lower the basis uh, as you consume it. So if your rental property was previously used as your main home, you must also decrease the basis by the following. Gain you postponed from the sale of your main home before May 7th, 1997, if the replacement home was converted to your rental property. Dis uh, District of Columbia first time home buyer credit allowed on the purchase of your main home after August 4. Uh, 1997 and before January 1st, 2012, amount of qualified principal resident indebtedness discharged on or after uh, January 1st, 2007. Special depreciation allowance. So for 2023, some properties used in connection with residential rental property activities may qualify for a special depreciation uh, this allowance is figured before figuring your regular depreciation deduction. So it's similar to kind of like the 179. We have another whole nother course or section uh, on that. Uh, if you want to dive in that in more detail. See chapter three of publication 946 for details. Also see the instructions for form 4562 line 14. If you qualify for but choose not to take a special depreciation allowance, you must attach a statement to your return. So oftentimes in software, if you qualify for the special depreciation, which oftentimes might not be real estate, but other types of property related to the rental property in a similar fashion as with a Schedule C, like equipment, possibly furniture, and so on and so forth, it will apply it by default, right? And then you can kind of elect not to take it if you don't want to. So again, kind of similar to the 179, giving you the benefit of it, similar to as if you got to expense it uh, up front. So rather than capitalize it and depreciate it. So the, so the details of this election are in chapter three of publication 946 and the instructions for form 4562 line 14.